Hello, um, I am really excited to welcome all of you to episode 32 of Alta Asks Live. This is the, right, wow, we uh, we started this, as we'll do a handful of them while the pandemic goes on, and here we are in episode 32. This is the digital event series of Alta Journal. We are a quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. We are a cool website. We are events like these. We are, we have a um, California book club going on right now. We're gonna get to that a little bit later as we've got a noir book um, for our December pick. We have a cool, a members only clubhouse community where we're really um, a fabulous magazine, if I do say so myself. And our current issue is all noir themed, which is why I am so, so, so excited to welcome today's guest. Writer, impresario, television host, film expert, noir enthusiast, and perhaps most importantly, Alta contributor, Eddie Muller. Eddie took us on a neo-noir film tour in this current issue of Alta. Um, and you can you can read all of Eddie's work in Alta online. Um, I've got a link directly below. He did a Q&A with us last week. Um, today, we're gonna chat about all things noir. Uh, we're going to talk for about 20 minutes and then we're going to get to as many of your questions as possible. So please use the chat feature over on the side or there's a question button that should be somewhere below us. And I'm going to dig through those and get. Um, we'll ask Eddie as many questions as we possibly can. Believe it or not, we're actually hosting a noir story contest right now. So Eddie, you can't enter. You're an Alta contributor. Um, but everyone else, you are welcome to participate in this. It's really fun. Um, there's there's a few weeks left to get your entry in. We've got cool prizes. So um, I will have details to that in um, the comments over here in a second. But um, without further ado, we want to cover a lot of noir ground. So I will not take up any more time. Eddie, welcome. Thank you, Beth. It's a, it's great to be here. I've been uh, very much anticipating our conversation. Likewise, Eddie and I have actually been having um, fun chats in rehearsal. We have a ton in common, um, but That's but true. mainly a love of noir. Mine is not nearly as extensive as Eddie's. Um, in, in our short Q&A that we posted last week, I think that that's the button you can click right below us, guys. Um, you spoke a little bit about the role of place in noir. The difference between noir set in San Francisco versus LA versus New York um, versus Paris. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of the place in noir? Um, yeah, well, I, I will start off by saying I have a gag that I usually tell about that. Uh, Los Angeles was clearly the epicenter of the film noir movement, at least in cinema. Um, but there's a lot of films set in New York as well. And I always joke that you can tell the difference between a New York noir and a Los Angeles noir because in New York, the camera tilts up because it's a vertical city. And in Los Angeles, the camera pans from side to side because it's a flat horizontal, you know, the horizon. Uh, and in San Francisco, you get both right? Because you've got the bay and you've got the hills and the whole thing. Um, but yes, uh, place is vitally important because, because these are crime stories and a lot of noir has to do with revealing the underside of what we consider to be normal life. So noir is revealing the dark side of New York, the dark side of Los Angeles, the dark side of San Francisco. Um, I also co-edited a book called Oakland Noir, which is part of a series from Akashic Books that has just spans the globe. It's like every city in the world, you know, Dubai Noir, uh, Delhi Noir, uh, you know, Duluth Noir. <laughs> I'm absolutely serious. There was a volume in that series of Duluth Noir. Um, and, and that's the, the principle behind all of those is like getting writers who understand uh, the alternative view of these places. So it, it, it's, it plays a big part. You, the noir that you've written, the, the fictional noir. Um, yes, Janine, this is being recorded. This will be up on Alta Online later today. Um, in your first novel, The Distance, um, and in both of your novels, it takes place in San Francisco, which is where you are from. It's where I was born. Um, and that your knowledge, what I was really excited about as a born in San Francisco, um, was your knowledge of old school San Francisco, the Lucas Deli references. It's like, yes, <laughs> Lucas Mortadella. 
Um, so how, you know, does it, does a writer need to have that kind of connection? You know, this in, in the distance, your main character, Billy Nichols is inspired by your dad. So you really can't get much closer of an inspiration than the guy who helped raise you. Um, how connected to the city, to that space, does the writer, does a noir writer need to be? Um, I, I don't know if if we should specify that it's a noir writer. It, it just depends on the writer and the story that they want to tell. I was definitely making San Francisco a major character in the story because that, that was vitally important to me. And the work I did on that book, researching a San Francisco that I did not live in, that predated me, um, informed everything that I do. Quite honestly, because you know, I, I I restore old films. I'm a preservationist now, and I kind of take the same approach when I'm writing fiction. If it's period fiction, uh, then I'm going to be a stickler uh, for veracity and authenticity, and I, I put a lot of effort into that. I mean, to the point where I would go to the library, and I had a timeline of events in the novel. And I put it all on a calendar and I would go to the library and read all the papers from the day that my fictional events were happening to make sure I understood what it was really like. What was the weather like? Was it raining on this day in San Francisco? I mean, I would, I would go that far uh, to be authentic. I have met other writers who just say, are you kidding me? That's, a, that's ridiculous. I make it all up. Right. I mean, um, I, I am friends with Lee Child, who is a hugely successful author of, uh, you know, adventure stories. You know, Jack Reacher is this guy that he created and he has fans all over the world who love this stuff. And they write him letters about the details in his books. And he says, Eddie, I don't know how to tell him. I, I make it all up. I mean, I'm describing weaponry and stuff and I'm just making it up. None of it is true. <laughs> So, so there are many approaches that you can use when, when, when you decide to write fiction. Um, well, I wanna, I wanna dive kind of into that preservationist, um, that, that role that you've taken on. I mean, you've got a lot of roles. You're a host on, of Noir Alley on Turner Classic Movies. You're an author. You've written um, a number of nonfiction kind of collections on noir. Um, but then there's the Noir Film Foundation, which you co-founded, and you, I, I have, I don't have 2020s, but I have 2029s, and you're, uh, we open with kind of a concern, I, can I read you a, your own work for a minute? You startled me there, Beth, because you said 2029, and I just had oh, this I'm moment sorry. where it was like, did we just miss 10 years? What I'm just happened? I'm hoping that we can just jump forward. Um, <laughs> you had 2019. I, I do mean 2019, yeah. Um, that there's there's an unease with, um, let me just, you wish everyone felt the way Martin Scorsese does. There are no old films, just movies you haven't seen yet. Truthfully, the unease I'm referring to doesn't exist in the culture at large. It exists within an ever expanding group of savvy and sophisticated cinephiles that is paradoxically perceived as increasingly marginal by the massive corporations that own classic cinema. And later on, you make a reference to classic cinema being, um, you know, 1990 would be regarded as classic cinema. So yeah. I wanna I, talk about what is so important about preserving as, as we're bombarded with content, film content. Now, so much of it is online and the way we watch movies is ever changing. That aside, Talk about why it is so important to preserve these films and continue to bring them, um, to push them forward to new audiences. Um, cinema has become our most uh, popular and easily ingested history. It's the, they, movies are the stories we tell ourselves about who we are, and it's vitally important that we remember what came before and where we came from. This this harkens back to what I was saying about uh, when I wrote The Distance and I became a preservationist because I became fascinated with, oh, this is what's here now, but I now realize that there was something different there 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And what led to that 
change. And I look at movies exactly the same way you would look at architecture or, or anything, you know, the style of music, like what has led to these changes? Uh, because it's all the story of who we are. And I just, I, I feel so strongly about not just preserving films as our history, but being able to present the films in a proper context so that it remains relevant. Because I am a believer that history is always relevant because not to trot out an old cliche, but we all know those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, which is something that is a lesson that should have been taken to heart <laughs> in, in uh, recent times in this country, right? Uh, in, in fact, you know, I don't wanna dwell on this. Maybe it's something people will ask questions about, but I was just writing a piece for the upcoming issue of our magazine about a moment that I had on September 24th, 2016, where I was introducing a film called The Prowler. And I, I tell the same stories many times because that's kind of my job. And a little voice in my head said, are you really saying all this again? Like, haven't people gotten it yet? And, and then after the movie, the movie was The Prowler, which was very much a product of the McCarthy era. And afterwards, a, a young guy came up to me in the lobby and said, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Are you telling me that artists went to jail in this country for for yeah. stuff they wrote and said? And I said, yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. <laughs> And uh, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like there are, the, you may know all the stories, but there's always new listeners. And, and so that's why I do what I do. You know, I try to put all this stuff in a context that makes it relevant, especially for younger people. I mean, I have a tremendous cross section of people as the audience I now have. You know, the folks who saw these movies when they first came out and are so happy that we're keeping them alive but there's a whole new audience that I, my job is to make films and literature and all relevant to this newer audience so they don't just bypass it and say, well, we figured it all out. We don't have anything left to learn from these old movies. And it's like, oh, well, guess again. <laughs> uh, you know, we were talking about this a little bit before you and I, and I think that it's an important discussion uh, to have. and kind of hits on where you are right now. Um, you know, a lot of noir, a lot of older films, a lot of films in general, um, have problematic characters, problematic storylines, uh, racism, sexism, homophobia, uh, a, a mess of all of the things that we are incredibly sensitive to uh, around, especially right now. Um, can you talk a little bit about the how that exists kind of in older noir stories, be them film, literature, whatever. Um, and, you know, how, how can we continue to enjoy these movies um, with those kind of elements that we're not, you know, we're trying to avoid? Uh, again, I have to say, this is kind of my job now. And we talk about this on TCM uh, quite a bit because you, you have to provide context and perspective for this stuff. I am not a fan of, I'm just gonna use the term cancel culture because that's popular now. Uh, I don't believe in it. I think that if you start erasing the parts of history that you don't wanna look at, you're making a terrible mistake. Uh, but you do have to have context. And that's the, that is the job that I try to perform when I present these movies. Um, I believe that history is, is a wheel. It doesn't go forward in a straight line, it rolls. And <laughs> for whatever reason, we are constantly repeating the same things over and over again, but that wheel is moving forward. And so I think that watching these older films in which clearly there are sexist things happening, uh, you know, the treatment of minorities is a crime in some of these movies, but why would you want to erase that? Uh, you know, if it bothers some people to think that there are viewers watching it saying, yeah, those are the good old days, well, then, then it's our job to, to come on and say, you know, this is why these things existed. Or contrary to what you might think, the people who made this movie were not racist. You know, I mean, I know for a fact, like I've shown movies, say, let, I'm just picking a filmmaker, somebody like Nicholas Ray, 
he would put African Americans in his movies because he believed that they needed to be more represented. But of course, what were the roles that he could give them in the films, right? They were nightclub singers or janitors or porters or something, but he he gave them the roles. So if you watch his movies and you say, man, it's a shame, look at how racist this is. It's like, you need to understand that this was a film made by somebody who was an anti-racist. Uh, it, it's not always easy to get this across, but um, it's definitely worth doing. Yeah. Um, we're getting a lot of questions, so I'm going to dive right in to those. Um, all right, so we've got um, Shelly Acosta Smith asks, which modern noir movies should we watch? And I just want to let her know um, <laughs> that you <laughs> recommended three kind of under underappreciated, underacknowledged um, noir movies in California scheming, one of which is Devil in a Blue Dress. Um, that book by Walter Mosley is the California Book Club's December pick. So um, hopefully my friend Nassim can pop a link um, if you'd like to join us there. But um, other than the three that you mentioned in this Alta article, what neo-noir films should we check out? Um, you know, there's quite a few. I mean, pretty much anything that <laughs> that's a crime movie these days gets tagged with neo-noir. Um, I would say that... Um, the early Chris Nolan movies, um, like Following and Memento, are clearly Following is the movie that Chris Nolan made before he made Memento, which is the movie that put him on the map. Uh, and Memento, both of those movies are clearly noir. I love, and I know this splits the audience right down the middle, but I love David Lynch's Mulholland Drive. It is my favorite movie of the new century. And it's just a totally new way of presenting a noir story. The protagonist of the film is clearly like a classic noir character. Uh, and it's just a really, really intriguing film to me. It's kind of a bookend to, it's very clever because I know that Sunset Boulevard is one of David Lynch's favorite movies. And so he very consciously did Mulholland Drive as a kind of a modern bookend to Sunset Boulevard. And they're both about Hollywood, and they're both uh, very interesting depictions of the psychosis that Hollywood can instill in people. Uh, so I see those two movies as sort of a very intriguing double bill. Um, you, you know, there's there's all kinds of stuff. And, and what's funny to me is that the whole idea of neo-noir now extends far beyond the length of the original noir era, which lasted you know, from the early 40s to maybe the end of the 1950s, which is less than 20 years. But people start calling films neo-noir in the mid-1960s, which means that it would be going on for like 60 years now, right? Which would be a, yeah, triple the time of the original noir era. So at some point, these things are all just noir to me because, you know, I, I see a continuum where some people just see the original era and everything after. Is there, um, do you have a hard and fast definition of noir or is it like, what's that definition of porn? I know it when I see it. I know, uh, obscenity. It's the definition of obscenity, not porn. Sorry, Your slip is showing, Beth. Your slip <laughs> is showing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, I, I, I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. Um, I do have my personal hard and fast definition of noir, but what has happened in my line of work is I don't really apply it. I apply it for myself, but I find it unnecessary to apply it at large because I find it very, very limiting. And because my job, in addition to being the noir guy, you know, the czar of noir, uh, my job, like with TCM and the Film Noir Foundation and everything, is to keep people interested in classic cinema and older films. So I confess, if I'll call something noir that I truly don't believe it's it fits the hard and fast definition I have. But if I have to call it that to get people to watch it, I will do that. And, and I will not be embarrassed or, sh or ashamed to do that because one of the things that keeps noir alive is that there is no hard and fast definition. So the debate about what is noir is part of what keeps it so interesting for people. I mean, it, it's amazing. I've been doing this for over 20 years now and people just 
constantly you're saying, well, is this noir or isn't this noir? What do you think of this? Is that, you know, I do a, I do a thing to promote my noir alley show called noir or not, where I just, you know, the staff just throws movie titles at me and I off the top of my head respond whether I think it's actually noir or not. And people, hundreds and hundreds of people get online and argue about what I say. <laughs> and it, it honestly doesn't matter to me as long as people are actually intrigued enough to go watch the movie. That's the important thing. Watch the movie and make up your own mind. As long as you're enthusiastic and you have an open mind, that's all I care about. I am totally disinterested in, in creating the canon of noir that the, these 126 films qualify and everything else isn't really film noir. I, somebody will have to explain to me what the value of that is. Right. Um, Steve O'Neill um, is wondering, when did noir, the genre, become a thing? When did it grow in popularity? Um, and keep up the great work, Eddie. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I'm referring back to that comment I made a little bit earlier about uh, history is like the wheel that rolls forward and the same thing applies to noir. Um, I mean, I'm 61 years old now and I remember when I first discovered it and it felt like a totally new thing for me when I was a teenager, you know, reading my first books on film and people talked about this film noir thing, you know? Uh, so it goes all the way back to the 1940s and there were clearly examples now of what we call proto-noir where people were doing it, but it wasn't part of a movement yet. I mean, it was the 40s where it really became a movement with Hollywood as the core, but it really extended all around the world. And then it goes through cycles. You know, because the the that whole era of filmmakers that uh, came of age in the 70s that are now the grand old men of American cinema, you know, Scorsese and Friedkin and Coppola and Paul Schrader, all those guys, they all knew their film noir and they all kind of made their noir in the 70s. So you can very easily say that, you know, Mean Streets is a film noir and Taxi Driver is a film noir. Coppola's The Conversation is somewhat of a film noir. And it sort of goes in in cycles like this. And then you get to the Coen brothers and uh, Chris mm -hmm. Nolan. Uh, you know, I, I was going to say Quentin Tarantino, but he's kind of something else entirely. Right. Uh, but, you know, that that's just how it goes. It goes in these cycles. And, and filmmakers are always learning from the past and the filmmakers that went before them. And, and that's how things move forward. Davy Collins, hi Davy, um, says thanks again, Eddie, for publishing Garnier's Scoundrels and Spitballers. It's the most fascinating book on the topic of writers in Hollywood. Moving ahead to the fifties, are there any crime writers who, who act by bleeding for paperback originals, whom you feel could have contributed in a significant way to the late cycle had they gone west? Other than those like Goodis and Thompson, who did work in the industry a bit. Hmm, interesting. Well, I would, I would, uh, I would include Charles Williford in that group. Uh, I'm just going to throw this out because I think the the noir writer who is most not overlooked in terms of films made from the work, but overlooked in terms of historical um, recognition for the contribution is Patricia Highsmith, uh, who wrote, you know, Strangers on a Train. Uh, the talented Mr. Ripley, a number, and her books have been adapted many, many times, especially in Europe. But I still don't think that Patricia Highsmith gets the recognition she deserves as a truly noir writer. If you ask me to pick Eddie, who do you think are the genuine noir writers? I would probably say Jim Thompson, David Goodis, and Patricia Highsmith. I mean, those three to me are like the the three greatest American noir writers, and I am I am not overlooking the contributions of you know Hammett and Chandler and Cornell Woolrich mm -hmm. and James M. Cain, uh, but they exclusively wrote what I consider genuine noir novels. All right. Um, I'm loving this question from Greg Frank. 
It seems that a number of noir actresses, he uses Barbara Payton, Linda Darnell, Veronica Lake as examples, led rather sad, alcoholic lives. Any insight into why that might be? Uh, I'm going to say, Greg, that uh, why limit it to actresses? <laughs> uh, alcoholism was a huge issue in Hollywood. And I, I mean, it's not a pretty thing to talk about, but I will say that a great number of performers in the classic Hollywood era were highly functioning alcoholics. Probably most of the people that you consider your favorites were highly functioning alcoholics. And some people dealt with it better than others. Um, you know, and, and that's why, again, to, to just talk about this continuum I see, you know, people talk about Hollywood in the 1970s and how, oh my God, you know, Easy Rider changed everything and then everybody was doing cocaine and oh, it all changed Hollywood. And it's like, well, yeah, because it was just a different drug that came in. I mean, everybody was just drunk in, in the classic era in Hollywood. You know, Bogart had to quit at four o'clock every day because nothing got in the way of the cocktails, you know? And virtually every noir leading man Mitchum, Bogart, Dana Andrews, Robert Ryan, they were all functioning alcoholics. So uh, the women that Greg cited, like Barbara Payton, and, you know, I could say Gloria Graham is in that group. And, you know, Linda Darnell got out, but sadly, you know, she fell asleep smoking a cigarette and died in a fire. That's a little different than, that's a little different than like the Gail Russell found dead in a pile of vodka bottles in her apartment. That's, that's a, that's self-destruction. Linda Darnell was a tragedy of not of her own making. Um, anyway, I'm getting depressed just answering this question, so so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the next the next question. Um, okay, I actually I have a question. I would like to call you out on something that you uh, wrote in Alta, if I may. No, um, no way. Yeah. Um, so, like you were saying, you know, people get into these heated conversations. I th I am a noir novice. Um, but it, there is something about it, and maybe this is true of any kind of genre um, that people find themselves drawn to. Um, but now I'm going to contest one of your picks for um, eight great California film noirs. Okay. Why no Dark Passage? Oh, uh, I didn't include Dark. Okay, fine. I thought you were going to contest why something was on the list. I, well, um, I mean, I You've given us the Maltese Falcon, which is like the obvious San Francisco choice. Because uh, I forgot. <gasps> <laughs> no, I want to. Um, because I felt like I didn't. I didn't want to be. I'll tell you exactly why. Now that I think back, because I put Woman on the Run on that list, and I think I put Vertigo on that list, right? And I. I did not want to. Uh, be so San Francisco centric mm -hmm. that I had like f half of the films set in San Francisco because that would have been the Maltese Falcon, Dark Passage, Vertigo, Woman on the Run. Uh, I, you know, I and because Woman on the Run is my baby, uh, I mean, I kind of discovered that film and and restored it and got it and rescued it from oblivion. I'm not going to make a list of eight great California noirs and not put Woman on the Run on the list. So that's your answer, Beth. That is your answer. All right. <laughs> Maybe. Dark Passage is pretty great though. Dark Passage is pretty great if for no other reason than the totally empty Golden Gate Bridge with like two cars going across it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let me dive back in here to these questions. Um, can you talk about, um, uh, as we run out of time, the... Oh. I know, sorry. Hey, leave him wanting more. Um, the Distance introduces Billy Nichols. He is a uh, sports writer focused on boxing um, in San Francisco, as your father was. Um, I understand there is a third Billy Nichols book knocking around somewhere. Perhaps <laughs> yeah, yeah. Knocking around right, right back here. Um, when yes. can we expect that? What's the deal? What's the story? Uh, well, interestingly, that's one of the advantages of the pandemic is that it keeps me home. So I'm not traveling as much and I have more time to write. So the, the important thing was to do a revised and expanded edition of my original film noir book, Dark City, The Lost World of Film Noir, which I completed. And that will be coming out um, sometime in the late spring of 2021. 
Um, but but then uh, yes, the third Billy Nichols book, which is actually um, before any of this stuff happened with the TCM stuff and my quote unquote prominence now as a you know custodian of film history, American film history. Uh, I had started that novel, the third novel, which is set in Hollywood in the early 1950s. So, uh, and it combines like the world of boxing and Billy Nichols gets hired by a film director to come and vet his boxing movie to make sure it's, it's authentic. And then of course he gets wound up in the death of a former colleague turned screenwriter who uh, ended up on a short list of suspected communists. And uh, you know, he, he, you can see where it goes from there. So, <laughs> so uh, that's the premise of the third book, uh, which I am working on. Trust me. <laughs> he is, perhaps it's noir in general, just because it's so stylized. Um, do you ever see these becoming films? Would you like to see The Distance or any of your, your fictional work? Um, uh, I would love to. I would love to see the distance. But, you know, the distance. Uh, let me just fess up with something here. The distance was written as a standalone book. It was never meant to be a series of novels. But if you write mystery fiction, publishers want to put the hook in you and get a series of books out of you. So anybody who writes mystery fiction, they want a protagonist. And to be quite honest, Beth, this is something that can keep these books from being genuine noir because if you have a series protagonist, you know that person is not going to die. And I personally believe that the prospect of death is a major part of what makes mm -hmm. something noir. There has to be the threat of death looming at any point to, to really make it a, a true noir. And if you're writing, you know, that's why somebody like Mike Connolly who in his Harry Bosch things, you know, those those are great crime fiction detective mystery stories, but I hesitate to call any of them noir, despite the fact that Harry Bosch lives in a very noir world. But the fact that he's going to make it through every book, you know he's going to survive every book, uh, takes a certain noirishness out of the proceedings. Interesting. Um, all right, well, with that, I want to remind everyone that on Eddie's list is Devil in a Blue Dress. It's our December pick for the California Book Club. Next week, we're taking a, a quite a different direction. We're going 180, and we are welcoming Steve Sansweet. He runs Rancho Obi-Wan. He's got the biggest collection of Star Wars memorabilia in the world. Um, he will be joining us. He's, the, uh, he's a big guy at Lucasfilm. He's the fan kind of coordinator at Lucasfilm. He's going to be joining us next Wednesday, November 18th, 1230 here at um, Alta Asks Live. I am so grateful to Eddie Muller. I, I feel like we have so much. I could talk to you for hours, and I will have to watch you on Turner Classic Movies like everyone else. Um, thank you. But thank I, you I have so to tell you, Beth, I, I'm I'm a tiny bit disappointed that we're done. I was, I was just warming up, you know? Um, well, maybe we'll come back for um, part two. The, okay, uh, that would be great. I have, I would be happy to do that. I would be happy to do that. And I want to just, if, if you'll allow me, I just want to throw a shout out. Um, people who may not know this, I mean, I, I normally would be doing uh, a film noir festival right now in Washington, D.C. Uh, but this year, because of the pandemic, we're taking it online. So if you want to see some examples of international film noir, uh, we are doing that in conjunction with the American Film Institute uh, in outside D.C. So it's the AFI Silver Theater. So if people go to AFISilver.com, uh, they will see the schedule for the Noir City International Film Festival, which begins on Friday of this week. And it runs, oh. through, the, it runs through the 29th of November. And you can buy individual tickets or a pass. And of course, this is all virtual. So a, once a film becomes available, you can watch it anytime during that window from the 13th to the 29th of November. You will stream it on your laptop or your television or however you work these things out at home. But there's a lot of really tremendous films in there that um, 
further the notion that I presented that this was not exclusively an American phenomenon. Hollywood was the epicenter, but it spread all around the world. And that was a, in some cases, that was a two way street. So that uh, foreign films were influencing American movies and vice versa. So if you want to know what gangster pictures are like in Japan or in Buenos Aires or in Italy, uh, you can see that in this festival. We have, we have a film from Czechoslovakia, a film from Poland, a film from Sweden. Uh, it's a really great sampler of international noir. Um, Poland is so noir. I've been Poland for Christmas. It is snowy. Well, and I have to tell you, uh, Beth, a lot of these other countries really know what war, noir is because they have lived it. They have yeah. lived it right? Uh, America is learning it now. <laughs> With that, we're on our way out. Um, Eddie, thank you so much. This is really, really fun. Thank you for your beautiful work for Alta as well. It's a treat to have you in the magazine. It was um, great fun. Yeah. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Again, this will be up on altaonline.com later today. I'm going to hook you guys up with all of these links as well. So um, I'll, we'll take notes for you and um, get those off to you as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and take care, everyone. Thanks.